Welcome to my first Google On Air Hangout. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm really excited to try out this experiment and talk about black noise on its 20th anniversary. Kind of hard to believe 20 years has gone by, but what are you going to do? Time just ticks away. But we actually already have a question. Someone was very enterprising and submitted their question before 1 o'clock. I think her name is um, Macharia or Macharia D. Rose. And she has a really good question. Um, I think it's a she. Sorry if you're not. Um, she wants to know uh, if I think that there are other elements of other black musics that have not been implemented in hip hop and should they be? Um, so uh, what's interesting is that she's asking about elements of other black musics in hip hop which is sort of the fundamental logic of hip hop. Many of you know that one of the most innovative parts of the development of hip hop slash rap music is the use of materials from other African American and other worldwide musics, taking sounds and samples and rhythms and creating a whole new kind of collage out of those other sounds. So in fact, you have gospel, soul, R&B, funk, disco, uh, um, jazz as really fundamental elements in hip hop. So to answer the question, you know, I'm not even sure that there's any genre that hasn't been included in one way or another in particular. Um, hip hop has always been really profoundly um, invested in using lots of what we call sort of recorded or raw materials. I think probably what I'd say is that we need to think about the spirit of hip hop, that kind of collage effect as part of the way diasporic black music functions in general. And in that sense, you see it in gospel, right? Gospel borrowing both from blues, R&B, and the spirituals. You see that impulse everywhere. And in fact, I'd want to encourage us to think of new genres that could continue that tradition, uh, along with, with hip hop, of course. All right, let's see. Is there a follow-up question, Ms. Rose? Of course, are you related to me? <laughs> just say no, okay? It doesn't even matter if it's true. Just say no. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. We have another question coming in, which is, why did I write Black Noise? Why did I write Black Noise? Well, that is a big question. Um, but when I originally started researching and writing, I was in fact a graduate student um, at here at Brown, actually. I did my PhD here at Brown. And I really felt that at that point, which is the mid-1980s, late 1980s, that hip hop was going to be this amazing, fascinating force in music and wanted to write about it. Um, there had been really virtually nothing written on hip hop from a scholarly perspective at the time. So it was a little bit of a risk, a little bit of uh, kind of going out on a limb. And, uh, you know, I just had a kind of spirit of entrepreneurial, uh, you know, uh, trailblazing type of energy about it. And I felt that someone needed to take it seriously. So I took it on. And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I could be part of the first generation of people who, who wrote about it in a sort of serious and, in some cases, um, um, overly scholarly way. There's some word choices in black noise that seem unnecessarily obscure to me now. Uh, but it was also important that it be taken seriously in academic circles. So um, that's what motivated me to do it. All right, I'm keeping my answers for me relatively short so that I allow more questions to come through. Let's see if there's anyone else out there with a question for me. What else do we have? Um, let's see. Um, all right. Uh, okay, here we go. M. Handy, or M. Hardy, sorry about that, M. Hardy. And this question is, what are your thoughts about the influence of specifically lyricist Ice Cube and how his influence almost single-handedly changed the whole landscape of rap and black culture? Huh. So I'm going to assume um, Handy and Hardy, and you, you should correct me if you mean something different here, just follow up. 
but um, I'm going to assume you're using Ice Cube as a kind of lyrical primary figure for West Coast, what some people would call sort of, you know, L.A. gangster rap, if you mean something much more specific about his lyrical style. Um, you should say so in a follow-up question because I can't answer that uh, I, well, unless you, you know, that's what you're focusing on. Um, there's no question that Ice Cube and I think, you know, by extension, I, I think Dr. Dre is, is pretty significant in, in this regard too, um, in using some of the spirit of a certain kind of what, what at that point was an East Coast tradition of um, a kind of, you know, an aggressive form of of direct confrontation in lyrics, you know, Public Enemy and others on the East Coast uh, were sort of the progenitors of most of that at first. But what Ice Cube um, and um, NWA in general did was really capture the Los Angeles context for a particular type of community slash alienation at the same time. And the direct confrontation with police, while common on the East Coast in some way, was much more significant in the lyrics of Ice Cube and others. And the everyday sort of almost uh, nonchalant uh, tone that West Coast lyrical style took up, the sort of nonchalant everyday life. Um, style that was really important and interesting. One of, the, one of the reasons Ice Cube and others were created a kind of tension in their music from my point of view is that on the one hand they had that kind of driving aggressive sort of street gang tone but they also had a, almost a southern um, Texas and Arkansas west southern sort of lyrical lilting quality. So you had, it seems to me, a certain kind of tension that you didn't have in East Coast hip hop, which you, you had a lot of the aggression, but you, it was more quick and sharp and intense. But the West Coast had a little bit of a, almost opposition going there that I think created a lot of creative energy and tension. I'm not so thrilled with the film history of Ice Cube, but that's a different question. <laughs> All right, we got some more questions on tap. What do we have? What do I think? What are my thoughts about the lack? Um, let's see, what do we got? What are my thoughts about the lack of female presence in mainstream hip hop and why female lyricists of the caliber of Jean Grey choose to remain underground? This is from uh, Dara Nix Stevenson. Thank you for this question, Dara. Well, um, I could be here all day about the, the sort of marginalization of women, or some people call them femzies, um, in hip-hop. Um, but I think, you know, the main point I would make is that women in hip-hop and, and women in many aspects of music, but especially in hip-hop, have been really driven to the margins through a wide variety of forces that are working together. So they've been driven to the margins, firstly by the fact that most adolescent youth culture um, tends to be very gender polarized, and hip hop is extremely masculine in its control uh, mechanisms. Boys and young men narrate and control those spaces very strongly and do so in ways that often exclude women. Um, the record industry capitalizes on the use of a certain kind of black masculinity as its primary calling card for selling hip hop. And so women by definition, unless they're extremely masculine in their portrayal, which some are, they're automatically going to have to find another niche to occupy. Um, and so the kind of market value of street aggressive black masculinity for the industry in hip hop has rendered lots of variety of, of, of black expression less visible. So that would include black men who don't take up that persona as much. That would include queer communities, both genders, and of course women of both sexual orientations or all sexual orientations who may not be interested in taking up that kind of intense masculinity. The third major reason is that um, the other thing that has grown quite clear is that commercial hip-hop sells itself on 
not just aggressive masculinity, but on sexism and on a kind of manhood that is um, fundamentally elevated vis-a-vis -vis its disrespect of women. So in other words, the more value you have as a male figure in hip hop, the less connectedness, respect, and affirmation of women as a whole are part of your verbal profile. So women as a whole are sort of narrated as less valuable, as objects, as things to be controlled, as sexual toys, as um, women, as creatures who get in your way, who, who can stop you from achieving your goals. So when you put all that together, it's not surprising that women like Jean Grey and others are finding themselves in the underground as really the only viable place for them to express themselves as they are. All righty. Thank you for that. I really appreciate all these questions. Wow, how do I feel about the impact that Black Noise has had on upcoming scholars? Well, I've gotten a lovely set of, um, you know, emails and, you know, notes and texts and tweets and Facebook posts and just general communication over the years which has been so um, enriching to me. It makes me very proud that something I chose to do that was fairly unconventional at the time and took some significant risk on my part professionally. I didn't even have a career when I did it and all the signs were that I wouldn't have one if I wrote on hip hop. Um, that those risks paid off in so far as many people feel that it helped them see that you could take something that was in your everyday life and really um, take it seriously, analyze it, be critically engaged with it, and participate in scholarly circles through that route. So, you know, I think, I think ultimately I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, I think one of the things to really remember for younger scholars and younger people who are reading Black Noise is that that was a, an era, everything that was true about Black Noise and about hip hop in you know, 1990 to 1997 or 98 is not necessarily true today and not necessarily going to be true going forward. So that music and culture changes over time. The effects and the structural forces that shape it change dramatically over time. And we shouldn't talk about it as if it's almost frozen in time. But what applied to hip hop in 1989 will apply in perpetuity. So that would be something I'd want younger uh, readers to really keep in mind. All right, let us see what else do we have. Um, uh, this question um, uh, is about whether or not I think it's easier for queer MCs and rappers and musicians to come out and uh, participate in hip hop and rap music than a few years ago a la Frank Ocean, et cetera, or Zebra Cats, for instance. Um, definitely, it's much easier. I mean, it's clear it's much easier for everyone to be gay and queer in public as artists, as political figures, as everyday people. And this is a great thing. Um, whoever we are, you know, the more we can be who we fully are and be respected and appreciated for that, the better off we all are. Um, not just the individuals, but the society as a whole. So, I mean, there's no question it's easier. Um, I still think that one of the troubles with being queer in hip hop has to do with what I said a few minutes ago about how much a certain kind of masculinity, whether it's performed by men or women, straight or queer, that a certain kind of masculinity is extremely valued in hip hop. So there's a kind of aggressive, um, uh, dominating masculinity that pervades the style and the content of a lot of hip hop. And so I wonder how that might influence the ways in which various artists of different sexual orientations might perform themselves because of this kind of almost aesthetic drive that's happened in terms of the masculine performance of hip hop. But we'll see. We'll have to see what happens. That's another great question. All right, let's see. Um, what was the most difficult part of getting Black Noise finished and published? And what's the biggest takeaway from that experience? Wow, well, you know, <laughs> I didn't have trouble getting it published at that point because there was really nothing else like it. But getting it finished took a lot of work and a lot of energy. You know, it took a lot of commitment and um, a lot of 
poking and prodding and both from a professional standpoint getting my advisors to agree to let me get out of graduate school and then to uh, make sure I have the requisite number of interviews getting to people you know was was very difficult um, but you know ultimately um, I think the biggest challenge was making sure that I was doing it justice taking it as seriously as I could possibly take it and I think ultimately you know that's what I'd want people to remember that you know, you don't know how long things are going to last out here. You don't know what contribution you're going to make. And we should do whatever we commit to doing. We should do it wholeheartedly and with as much serious intent as we can. And not be casual, not be nonchalant, not imagine that it won't have an impact. Imagine you will because you really never know. I had no idea that people would care one ounce about black noise by 1996, let alone 2014. And, um, you know, of course, I might have done a few things differently, but I did try to do the best I could. And I think that's, that's and, and really I wanted to do that because I thought black people and young people in hip hop needed me and everybody else to take them seriously and to take what they create seriously and to put it on the map. Um, not to just take the easy route and follow the most popular thing or follow the most popular artist and just do a profile, but instead to really put it in historical context, and take it seriously. And that was ultimately the biggest challenge that I faced and that I, in a sense, tried to hold myself to in a standard. Now, that's the most important thing I want to be the takeaway from my perspective on, on those years. Okay. We have a question about the fact that there's been substantial work on the negative impact of commercial hip hop on black girls. What is my broader perspective of what kind of counter narrative black girls and or the construction of black girlhood has to offer that work? So in other words, what other what are some other counter narratives that black girls or the culture of black girls can offer to counter this dominant negative set of images about black girls and hip hop. Okay, so the, the first, I have to answer this question in two parts and I'll try to move quickly, but the first thing is really to sort of talk specifically about why black girls are in so much peril in terms of hip hop storytelling. Um, and I think that is important because for those of you who are sort of born up on hip hop, right, who don't know a moment when there wasn't hip hop, you may not really be as able to see just how saturated hip hop is, not just with general mainstream sexism, but but a, but a particular ex, sort of common, everyday, expressive, normal uh, culture of, of really a kind of hostility toward, toward young black women. And um, it's either in the form of how they're appreciated, the nature of the way their sexuality is exploited for appreciation, and the way the rest of their humanity is just uninteresting, unengaged, the way their experiences around sexism and their experiences around society's racism against women is just marginal and uninteresting um, to the, the dominant narrative in hip-hop. And that's, that's really problematic. There is no other black music that is so explicitly, narratively, creating a kind of culture of self-disrespect for women in the history of black music. Now, I'm not saying that there were not people involved in those musical genres who disrespected women. I can't say what jazz musician or what R&B band went around disrespecting women when they were on tour, but their lyrics, their stories, there is no, blues included, did not produce such a consistent narrative of hostility and disrespect against young black women, uh, particularly in such widespread ways, the way commercial hip hop is just saturating all the airways. So we do have a real problem with that. And I think we would be doing ourselves a tremendous disservice to deny this in an effort to defend hip hop. I think really to defend hip hop is to criticize this so that hip hop can be its best self and we can understand whether the forces that have brought this part of hip hop to the fore. But in terms of everyday culture, I think the culture of young black girls is itself under assault because hip hop is really a critical part of the culture of young black girls. Um, and I think it has a major, major influence. But I think in general, one of the things that's important about girls' culture, particularly pre-puberty, is the sense of um, um, confidence about overcoming things. You know, young girls, lots of researchers on the psychology of young girls, in particular the psychology of young black girls, is that 
they are able to imagine and move toward goals that are seemingly very likely to be insurmountable, but to practically and profoundly move toward those goals with a level of confidence that's extremely important. I think if we could harness those spaces and build them and develop more critical skills, um, it would be really, really important. Um, and and it, could, it could transform what's going on. All right, let's see. What are some key differences whew, between black noise and hip hop wars? Black noise in 1994 and hip hop wars in 2008. Well, they're vastly different. They're vastly different books. Um, you know, black noise was written at a moment when hip hop was not a global phenomenon. It wasn't, you know, largely uh, controlled by major corporations around the world. Um, there were thousands of local outlets for creativity, including small black radio stations um, that were able to promote local narratives. There were spaces for public performance. It was a, a very, a much more organic environment. So part of what the goal of Black Noise was, was to reveal just how important socially, psychically, emotionally, and politically hip hop was and musically um, to the world. Um, what drove hip hop wars was a deep worry that the most powerful, the most progressive, the most sustaining, the most enriching elements of hip hop that were largely part of a long tradition of black music as a sustaining, um, um, uh, spiritually enriching part of, of black people's survival in the West um, was being depleted. And that hip hop's primary energies were for profit, for self-exploitation, and for the entertainment of others who mainly wanted to d enjoy and discard um, whatever it was hip hop was giving them and give them the right to perform a certain kind of blackness without taking seriously the enormous pain and suffering poor black youth, particularly in major cities, continue to face. Um, you're looking at an unemployment rate for black teenagers in Chicago that's about basically 100%. It's between 90 and 95%. And, you know, that's not the kind of number that's in any way acceptable. By contrast, for whites, it's on average, you know, 20, 25 percent. It's, it's, it's a massive difference. So you're, you're talking about economic evisceration, incredible police profiling, um, very limited job opportunities, and all of the stresses and struggles that generations of discrimination creates. And I felt that what had happened to hip hop was that it was no longer able to adequately help us address those concerns at the same time as create a bomb of community possibility, which was what I thought hip hop was largely um, giving the world in the 1980s and early 90s. So hip hop wars, the biggest distinction is a challenge to the commercial takeover and to black complicitness, to black people's willingness to participate in that takeover. You know, Russell Simmons, you know, P. Diddy, uh, Damien Dash, Jay-Z, etc. I'm just giving you some examples. I'm not targeting them in particular, but that it's easy to say it's a white corporation phenomenon, but, but frankly, there are a lot of black middle-class entrepreneurs who spend a lot of their time trying to figure out how to participate in that takeover. So that, that's what Hip Hop Wars is trying to do, is challenge that process. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. Um, we have a question about um, hmm, what surprised me the most about how black noise has been received over the last, um, oh wait, we have a, okay. Um, uh, what surprised me the most about how black noise has been received over the past 20 years? Um, I guess, you know, probably uh, just the how nourishing it's been for some young scholars in terms of giving them a language to think about the culture as a whole. Um, you know, there's been a lot of great books written over the last 20 years on hip hop. There have been some okay books written, there have been some not so good books written on hip hop. But I've been really um, honored that so many young people find things about it that sort of connect with them, where they'll say, you know, this helps explain things I didn't understand. And um, 
you know, there's a lot around the structure that created hip hop socially that hasn't really been adequately continued in the scholarship. And so I'm, I'm really um, impressed by the fact that, that young people have found so much in that process in, from Black Noise, how hip hop comes into being, what are the forces that, that push it into existence. So that, that's been a major, major factor. Um, okay, Nate has a question. Nate, how? Um, what do you wish you had included in Black Noise? Oh, that's a good question. I think the thing I wished I had spent some time on was um, freestyling and the importance of improvisation um, and the performative spaces of the cipher. I would say those three things I wish I had spent time on. Um, I think, you know, the chapter on the music and the technology was, was you know, a, a good thing to have done. If I had it to do over, I would have added a chapter on, or a section on the notion of improvisation and um, the the complexity of, of lyrical performance and improvisation. I don't think there's been enough work on that so far. All right. Um, let's see. If you're watching or listening now, um, there's a lot of room in the queue. I think there's only one question in front of you, so. Go on ahead and ask me any questions you want. We still have about a half an hour. Um, so let's see. This one is, what would you most want to tell readers who might be reading Black Noise for the first time in 2014, 20 years after it was written? Well, whew, well I think uh, I want to say a couple things. One is that, um, I think I said this a little bit earlier, it's not 1989, it's not 1992, it's not 1994. So some of the, the political uh, statements about hip-hop does not apply today as easily. I think that hip-hop's role as a resistive cultural movement is not nearly as uh, consistent as it used to be. I think we're, you know, a lot of hip-hop embraces market culture. Um, and market culture, for the most part, is a profoundly destructive force for poor people. Um, and uh, I think for poor black people, it's extremely destructive. And therefore, it's not something that I think should get understood as resistive. And I think a lot of times we come to books and we think, oh, this is true in perpetuity. Well, it's not. So the question is, what, where is resistive hip-hop today? What is resistive hip-hop? Don't assume all hip-hop is resistive in the way that in some ways black noise implied, partly because of the time frame and the context and what hip-hop was in that moment. Um, so I would, um, you know, I would really want to caution people about that. And, and I guess the second thing I would say is to, um, try to carry forward the spirit of the idea that Black Noise was trying to get at, which is that, you know, culture matters and what we do and what we consume and the world we live in um, is often mediated and transformed by the things we're invested in. So, you know, when artists were, hip hop artists were the first to really start to rhyme about police profiling and many other kinds of things that are now in the mainstream about, about incarceration and the experiences of trying to be unemployed and bad schooling and you know that, that these things really matter for us to be aware and to have a story for ourselves. So I want people to take away the, the sense that they have an obligation to do the same thing today whether it's hip hop or not. Sort of to find what the hip hop of today would really look like. Not hip hop as it exists but the spirit of early hip hop in today's uh, generation. And I, and I think that, that would be something I'd really love young people to, to take away from it. Okay. Um, not a question. Um, oh, this is really sweet. Uh, um, I really appreciate this, Handy. Um, it's just a statement about uh, thanking me for this hangout and for my drive and studies and providing a valuable voice in the art form, and um, you didn't want me to go by and not know how much I'm appreciated. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. It's, you know, it's complicated um, to do this kind of work because sometimes you have to make people angry, and sometimes you have to make people who love hip-hop frustrated, and um, people who are invested in 
um, some of the worst elements of what society gives us, partly because it's so easy to be invested in them, and it's so funky sometimes to be invested. So it's hard to, you know, you feel like you're kind of breaking people's hearts when you tell them, you know what, this is not what you think it is. You know, this may very well, um, um, you know, really harm people even though we love it so much. Um, so I really appreciate that. Now I'm hearing that we in fact only have 30 minutes. Is that right? Hold on a second everybody out there in video land. So we actually have to end now. Holy mackerel, I thought I had an hour, but it turns out I only have a half an hour. I don't have any idea why. If you're there and you have questions, tweet them to me and I will try really hard to follow up this afternoon with some tweet replies to your questions if you're in the queue. I guess we're having a technological problem of some kind. I'll figure it out. Maybe we'll do another one soon. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And uh, let me know what you thought, and we'll try it again. Bye-bye.